This public hearing conducted by the Committee on Appropriations and Judications will now come to order. Notice of the public hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets by electronic format on Wednesday, February the 14th, 2018, <coughs> with a second notice provided on Saturday, February the 17th, 2018. Notice the hearing was also made known on the Guam Legislature's website. On today's agenda, we, we have two bills. Bill number 1-2S, um, as introduced by the Committee on Rules by the request to make it law in Guam, the Governor of Guam, in accordance with the Organic Act. This was a special session bill which has been renumbered Bill 245. An act to revise the business privilege tax from 4% to 6% by amending Title 11, Division 2, Chapter 26, Section 26202, and to dedicate the revenue to be collected from the expanded revenue stream to 1. The Guam Memorial Hospital for its operation and modernization. 2. The Department of Education to fund its capital needs. And 3. The General Fund of the Government of Guam to address the tax base erosion resulting from the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. <coughs> also on today's agenda is Bill 2. 44-34 COR, introduced by myself, an act to repeal section 16311 of chapter 16, title 3, Guam Code Annotated, and to amend section 26602 of chapter 26, title 11, Guam Code Annotated, and to amend sections 1 and 2 of chapter 6 of public law 34-42 relative to repealing the referendum of, on tax increases raising the gross receipts tax from 4% to 5% beginning April 1st, 2018 until January the 1st, 2020, and reducing the fiscal year general fund appropriation to the Guam Legislature, the Office of Finance and Budget, and the Office of the Governor, and freezing the Competitive Wage Act of 2014 until March the 1st, 2019, and to cite this act as the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Act of 2018. I know this is our third session today, but in the earlier sessions, I um, had to confess to committing near an act of plagiarism in that the Bill 244 was not an original idea of mine. Um, over the last month, I have um, been spending a lot of time watching C-SPAN, watching all the state of the state addresses being given by all the governors across the country, hoping to get some insight as to how they're addressing their um, financial shortfalls. I've also actually even resorted to TED and listening to TED talks in the hopes of finding some kind of idea on how to be able to address this. Even going to YouTube and Googling how do you deal with austerity and in one of the, one of the um, my Googles in YouTube, I came up with an interesting clip, and it was actually from Guam. And uh, I have to admit that Bill 244 took all the, took all the um, suggestions in from that clip and incorporated it. And so I'll play it for you now so you understand where that bill uh, originated and um, how I thought it would be a good idea in as much as it did stabilize things and um, the economy grew for a while there or at least stabilized um, until just recently so we'll play that clip at this time I don't have very good news about your government tonight I made some decisions so that public schools can stay open this year the hospital can have medicine, and so those most in need do not have to suffer more than they already are. Our finance directors are continuing to assess the government's cash position for this fiscal year. Their preliminary reviews disclose that there is no apparent course of action that will result in positive 2011 cash balances as reported by the prior administration to the Transition Committee. Sometime over the next nine months, 
we may quite frankly run out of cash. And if we do, we will not be able to pay employees, run the hospital, keep schools open, or help the needy. If we do not close this cash gap, those in need will suffer most. It will negatively affect mental health, COLA, the hospital, and nonprofit organizations like Catholic Social Services and Sanctuary. This is money to feed the homeless, shelter abused children, help victims of domestic violence, assist the elderly pay for their medication, and to aid families struggling with disabilities. We can't leave these people behind. We can't turn a blind eye and watch them suffer as the money runs out. And we also can't keep holding your tax refunds. Ray and I are keeping our promise and are taking immediate actions. We had to act today because I refuse to shut down the government or to have a mass layoff of teachers, police officers, doctors, and other professionals of the government. Ray and I are issuing further orders to cut costs. We are directing all agencies to reduce the cost of electricity by at least 10%. Paper reduction through greater use of digital communication, double-siding printing, and recycling will be mandatory. We will authorize audits of fuel expenses and the use of 24-hour vehicles. We will be investigating the consolidation of office space to save on rentals. And as of today, the Hay Study is suspended. I cannot speak to the reasons our predecessors decided to implement the Hay Plan based on the finan financial information we have before us today. All I know is that it was an empty promise. The government can't afford it. And now our hardworking government employees will have to shoulder the burden of that empty promise. These actions do not include further cost cuts. That will be made when agency directors submit their assessments this month. We expect further containment of spending through innovative ideas. And this includes the health insurance liability. We are looking at ways to reduce the cost of health insurance. There are legal issues, issues that we must address first. We need to determine whether legally that this can be affected. To all the government employees, I'm asking you to understand why this must be done. We need to make sure that our neighbors and friends most in need of help do not suffer the most. I will restore the Hay Study as soon as we can afford it. And I know that with other cost containment and restructuring initiatives that we will undertake, we can get this government back on track. In the meantime, we will lead by example. We've reduced the personnel costs at the governor's office alone by nearly 20%. We've consolidated positions and we're doing without a lot. We're also reducing costs in every other way we can paper reduction, printing, postage, power, and water. My staff and I will be adopting a public school to clean regularly so we reduce the budget burden on public schools and the mayors. The Lieutenant Governor also will be leading volunteer service projects. His Comps for Kids program will bring computers to classrooms. And he is calling on the private sector to join his beautification tax force to alleviate funding strains of public works, Parks and Recreation, and the mayors. I want to thank my wife, Christine, and Ray's wife, Notch, for their volunteer efforts there. And finally, Ray is taking personal responsibility for the Guam State Clearinghouse so that we can ensure that we receive as many federal dollars as we can. We're very serious about fixing these problems, and there is a bright future ahead. But before we realize that future, we must make some adjustments so that we can meet our obligations to those who need them most. Thank you and good night. With that, we'll uh, call up the first panel. Matt Sablon, Ken Leon Guerrero, Daryl Taggarty, Andrew Bynum,
Michael Borja, Art Snogastine, Bill Rages. Mr. Swan. Uh, buenos and alpha day, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Matthew Sablon, the Director of the Department of Agriculture. I come before your committee to testify on Bill Numbers 244-34-COR, an act to cut back salary, and Bill 245-34-COR, an act with no salary cutback for government employees. <clears throat> I am in support of bill number 245 and in opposition to bill number 244. On bill 244, the cutback of salary increases for line agencies resulting from the Competitive Wage Act of 2014 would definitely impact the livelihood of employees who are dependent on their current salary. Offsetting their, pre their personal finance obligation, not to mention the proposed increases of utilities, fuel, medical insurance, and other family obligation. Should this go into effect, employees will be forced to seek a second job with private sector to make ends meet due to the reduced income. On Bill 245, Retention of employees' current salary and decrease of the business privilege tax to, to 6%. To maintain government stability as well as funding both Guam Memorial Hospital and Department of Education will be acceptable. As we all know, that the increase will be borne by consumer through indirect means of paying for higher groceries, goods, and other form of personal need for two years. That department has 85 employees that will be greatly affected by Bill 244. The divisions of the department and operations and mandates <clears throat> affected from this cutback are animal health, agriculture development services, forestry and soils resources, biosecurity, and aquatic and wildlife resources. The department's cost savings is realized from budgeted positions for employees that are on military duty, recent retirement, separation and unfilled positions due to declination of interviewed applicants and insufficient applicant uh, list. In addition, we are very mindful of cost saving with uh, utilities and energy and also with our logistical and operational uh, supplies. Uh, with that said, I thank you for providing me with this opportunity to all offer testimony on these bills. This is Masi. Thank you. Ms. Leonguero. I watched the proceedings today as an endless parade of administration officials came through these halls to advocate for the 11,000 uh, employees who work for government in Guam. And I don't want to minimize their efforts, but I want to speak today for the 55,000 employees who don't work for Government of Guam, the majority of whom are in lower paid service type jobs that have no benefits. So while they are talking about the Government of Guam employees, we have to recognize that the bulk of this pain is going to be felt by people who are currently working two or three jobs, who currently do not have any medical benefits, who currently are receiving food stamps or GURA, and those programs are going to come under fire next. So we have to be looking at a bigger picture here. The big picture is we have a very bizarre economy. No other state, no other region has an economy like Guam. 48% of our gross domestic product is government expenditures. 52% is mostly uh, small businesses with in service industries with uh, the bulk of their employees struggling from paycheck to paycheck. So we have to keep that in mind. Having said that, 
we need, as taxpayers are concerned that things are happening way too fast. Even though Adeloupe and the legislature has known for years this problem was coming, you guys have literally waited till the last 10 seconds before you have done anything about this. And from what I've been able to see, you haven't done everything you can do about this. The governor, governor proclaims there is no fat left to cut, yet I'm hearing on the radio advertising, promoting Guam International Airport. Why are we spending money promoting Guam International Airport? It's not like passengers have a choice, like in Southern California, where you have 10 regional airports within an 80-mile drive of Los Angeles. So why are we spending money on things like that? I saw a bunch of directors parked at a restaurant. I saw these luxury SUV vehicles with Government of Guam license plates. I'm a retiree on a fixed income. I drive a 15-year-old pickup truck. And I'm looking over here at all these people coming through crying poor as they get into their government paid luxury vehicles with their government credit cards over their shell. So for the governor to claim there is no fat left to cut, I beg to differ. I spent a career in private industry going into companies that were going broke and helping them turn around. And 90% of the time we were able to do it without laying off any people just by working on cutting the fat. Now, on this subject, we have a situation where the people are very concerned because just in the last couple of months, we have heard pr proclamations from Adeloupe that everything was wise and wonderful. Things couldn't possibly be any better. We even had President Trump declaring we were going to get a tenfold increase in tourism, none of which happened. And then in just a matter of weeks, we have announcements from Adeloupe that we're in an emergency situation. We need a 50% increase in business privilege tax, and we want it tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, and if you don't give us that 50% increase in business taxes, the, the payless payday start next month. And then on top of that, we have a whole list of government officials who have been testifying before you for the past couple of weeks about what dire straits the government is in. We're going to be 66 million short this year, 100 million short next year, and yet in the same day we have an announcement that we have a $17 million surplus and we're submitting Guam's first billion dollar budget all in the same day. Now, if the speaker, if you, this body hadn't reduced Adeloupe's budget by 60 million last year, instead of that 17 million surplus, which remains to be seen, he would have been announcing, well, he probably wouldn't have been announcing, he would have been spinning a $47 million deficit for 2017. So at least one thing has worked in the favor of the people of Guam, and that was the resolve of this legislature. And contrary to the governor's proclamations that if you didn't give him all the money he wanted, furloughs would happen, agencies would be cut, and they'd shut the doors of Guam Memorial Hospital. None of that happened. So now the current, ex the current declarations, and actually he said that the year before when you cut the budget by 30 million. So his current assertion that if you don't give him a 50% increase in business privilege tax this week, Payless paydays are going to start next month. Agencies are going to be closed, and the hot doors of the hospital are sh going to be shut. Don't ring true to me, because he's used that line two times before. So the legislature is not blameless in this either, because we have known for years that this financial tidal wave was coming. It started when we had that first audit report in 2014, that we were $60 million in debt. Now, to the credit, you guys did trim his budget a little bit. And then in 2015, we had the announcement we were only $59 billion in debt. And you trimmed his budget just a little bit. But nowhere did I see the kind of due diligence at the committee level that would have rooted out opportunities to reduce waste without eliminating headcount. So right now, 
the 34th legislature, most of you who campaigned on bringing financial stability to government of Guam as one of your key priorities, the most we've seen so far out of this body has been nearly 400 resolutions on everything from the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Comoran to graduating, congratulate, congratulating people on seven years of continuous employment. I would have thought, considering the financial condition this government was in, we would have seen more action on higher priority items than things like that. So the lack of action by this body as well as Adeloupe in light of our financial situation reminds me a little bit of uh, Nero fiddling while Rome burns. Because all of our politicians and top government managers saw smoke on the horizon in 2014 and did nothing. We saw flames on the horizon in 2015 and still nothing. Now the house is burning down, you guys are finally deciding to act. And we hear the governor exhort all of his employees to come down to the legislature to demand the 50% increase in uh, business privilege tax over a pay cut. Neither one of these bills solves the problems that got us here. That is my concern. This is going way too fast. And the only solutions that we have been able to come up with, with the best and brightest of Adeloupe and the best and brightest of the legislature, is a 50% increase with no cutbacks on anything, or a 25% increase with a freeze on some expenditures and some cutbacks. I think, as elected officials, both you and Adeloupe owe the people of Guam more. We are not a rich population. We are not a, a, a cash flush population. We are a population that's living from paycheck to paycheck and already the Trump tax cuts have been spent. They went to the $61 a month increase in the average GPA power bill. They went to the $30 increase in fuel, uh, fuel tax for me. And people who drive newer cars and bigger cars are probably spending more than $30 more in fuel tax. It went to the six or seven dollar a month increase that we're, I'm seeing in my water bill. It's gone to the nearly 20% increase I've seen in consumer goods in this past year. Right now, a candy bar at local retailers has gone from $1.09 to $1.29 and it's all across the board. So we, out here, the people that are struggling from paycheck to paycheck, and remember, 30% of our population are retirees on a fixed income. We're having a hard time. And then for you guys to come forward, and I'm saying the generic you, elected leaders and politicians, and the only options you have are tax people a little more or tax people a lot more, I think that's, that's uh, very, very unsettling for all of us. Now, this strategy has been tried in the past, as I understand it. I wasn't here when it happened. But people have told me that it wasn't long-lived. It was painful during its, in, during its uh, inception and run. And there was a very high political cost that was paid afterwards. Remember, the lesson, there, there's a philosopher, George Sadayama, who said, those who don't learn the lessons of the past are doomed to repeat them. So if it didn't work then, what has changed to make you guys think it's going to work now? What has changed here in the economy that makes you think it's going to work now? Remember, this has to be a very delicate dance. Any changes you have to make, you have to make with a scalpel. These two bills are proposing to make changes with a chainsaw. It's going to be a very, very unsettling, uncomfortable, unpleasant experience for everybody, all because you guys have taken the easy way out and kicked the can down the road until the can hit the wall and bounced back. Now what we have to do is we have to do the hard work. And the hard work is getting to the root of the underlying causes of the problem. This Trump tax cut didn't happen overnight. We were already $105 million in debt before the, track, the Trump tax cut. And the fact that even knowing we were $105 million in debt, Adeloupe didn't do anything, 
They're the executive branch. They had the power and the authority to make changes when they could and chose not to. Instead, we have a long parade of administration officials all day and going into the night who are going to come through here and tell you this is the only option you have. And they are wrong. Until you have gotten down into the details and identified every expense in every department and agency and eliminated the non-mission non critical functions, you have not done everything we can do to cut the fat. So, none of these bills are good. One's worse than the other. So, in closing, I would just like to remind you of the uh, poem, The Vicious Cycle from Socrates, and the last line in the poem reads, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. And for you to sit here and say, this is where we are, people of Guam, we're either going to raise your taxes by 50% or we're going to raise your taxes by 25%, that's unacceptable. You guys have to do better because you can do better. We know you can do better. We put our trust in you. That's why you're sitting there. What we need to see on our part is the effort that we elected you to exert. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taggarty. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Speaker Cruz. Thank you for these hearings. They've been very entertaining and uh, informative all day. You've been sitting through them. I've been watching on TV, and this is this is some heavy lifting that has to be done. So thank you for having this hearing. I appear before the committee in opposition of both of the bills, although the intentions and some of the features are commendable. I just don't agree with either approach. With all due respect to the governor and my former colleagues and the governor's cabinet and technical staff, I prefer your strategy, Mr. Speaker, to examine the cost of our government and put it on a solid foundation before committing additional resources to Guam Memorial Hospital. Both bills would raise the business privilege tax. Every tax percentage increase is permanent inflation in consumer prices in local stores. Permanent. The general cost of living on Guam will rise just to support Gov Guam. Recent tax cuts are reducing withholding, thus increasing paychecks and cash available to spend. So both bills propose that Gov Guam reap the windfall of stimulus policy of the Trump administration and appropriate that money to itself. Bill 245 does not roll back salaries. Without a rollback of GovGuam salaries to pre-hay levels, you are balancing GovGuam payroll on the backs of private sector workers, most of whom are at-will employees without job security, without health insurance, without paid retirement, at any of their multiple jobs. Is it right to do that? To see where the cost of government can be reduced, the speaker needs help from committee chairs to measure the value of agency services to the public. Oversight is a responsibility to taxpayers, as majority party members of this body ensure that the public is well served through efficient use of appropriations, either by management or design. For too long, oversight chairmen have used their positions instead to cultivate favorable voter constituencies within the agencies. If committee chairs have been doing their jobs, they would already know where to cut or reorganize. I'm going to skip down through here instead of reading the whole thing. Has the government examined employment policy? Lifetime employment? as institutionalized in the government retirement plans and decades-old position descriptions, is an artifact of the 1950s through the early 1980s. Is there any effort to systematically evolve the government workforce? Changing faster than our workers' careers are competing public-private service delivery models, technology, and competitive skilled worker wages in other markets. Bill 245 asks the legislature to fund GMH on an emergency basis. This is not the first time, only the latest. 
And I understand because I quite agree with their plight. But it is a plight under their control. They have internal autonomy, generate their own revenues, and the governor with his Organic Act superpowers has their back. They are part of the executive branch, but is there any context to the request? Has there been careful coordination of all government policies and appropriations that together comprise GovGuam's participation in the health industry on Guam? While the governor has the directors and specialists in each agency to advise him, the legislature has a committee with oversight on health that should make sense of how spending on GMH is optimal in context of all spending on health in the Guam market for health services. Where GMH has emergencies, the legislature has policies. Are you prepared to make that decision today? Again, using the example of GMH, its roof leaks, making areas unsafe. Its PA system wiring was grounded out and became a noted deficiency during inspection. Installing a new PA system will cost a quarter of the original cost to seal the roof and last longer than the cement roof's rebars that are now rusting and may not meet hospital code in another five to ten years. Did we save any money by deferring maintenance? All of these matters of legislative oversight all of these are matters of legislative oversight that have not happened for a generation and it shows. The problem is not money because we have more than six or seven years ago. The problem is not federal policy because federal laws, policies, and prerogatives have always been closer than you would admit. We've known the Republican tax cuts have been coming for over a year since President Trump was elected. And both houses of Congress are under GOP control. The problem is not immigrants, because the moment they land here or present themselves at our schools or hospitals, they are entitled to equal treatment under our laws. It is simply standing policy. So what's the problem? The problem is that elected officials and their appointed assistants are, every two to four years, given the power, office space, and budget to address this community's problems. But they, you, have become too comfortable playing that role that they, you, forgot to read their jo own job description. Look at the calendar and figure out how to, do, how to earn your pay within the time allotted. After a generation of this, the community is saddled with new chronic problems to replace the old chronic problems. If it were not for receiverships and stipulated orders, we would still be building a burning mountain in order, showering in Hanum Taki, hoarding federal monies intended for science and math labs, throwing all of our mentally ill relatives and neighbors into a single ward, and so on. The problem is our elected leaders have not communicated a vision of our future that deserves consensus that all of us can understand and work towards. Is that not the working definition of leadership? We voters think that it is enough to place a cast of actors on stage and watch the entertaining show without demanding that the better actors also deliver some message of substance to permanently better our lives. In looking over what is requested by both bills, it appears that another approach can be considered. And I'll admit, like Mr. Speaker, you did in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in crediting the, the source of your uh, video that you showed, that these ideas were based on the first draft of my friend Ken's testimony today. My draft bill, and it, you should have it attached to my testimony. Is it attached? Is it there? Draft bill? My draft bill offers a policy decision package designed to minimize negative fiscal impacts and commit government decision makers to improve public service over a 10-year period. It also provides immediate financing to stabilize government revenues and the resource of time for building consensus on priority cost reduction and efficiency measures. Please run your own projections of revenues, cost avoidance, and organizational, organizational flexibility expected to result from adopting my proposal and compare it to the bills being heard today. Briefly, my draft proposes seven points. The first one is to generate $100 million through the issuance of a 10-year tax bond 
for the timely payment of government obligations through the next two fiscal years. Double real estate taxes as a source of repayment for this tax bond. Rollback of Guam employee pay adjustments implemented in 2014 as proposed in Bill 244, Section 4. Extend the Guam use tax to collect directly from online retailers shipping to Guam resident purchasers. Delink from the Mirror Guam tax law, sell GPA generation capacity, and commit to conducting detailed legislative oversight review of government operations annually for the next 10 years to annually identify budget items to be cut and deauthorize functions where necessary. I don't expect the legislature to use an emergency government revenue stabilization bill to, stall, to solve staffing or funding issues in each agency. I do expect the government to stabilize revenues and cut where it can. If there is a better method to cut costs in executive agencies that will produce an equivalent dollar reduction to rolling back the Hay Study pay increases, it should be under consideration now. This is a deliberative body. You do not have the luxury of time, so please put your heads together and act. You asked for a seat in this legislative term, and we placed you here. Now this is the, the work you asked to do, and all eyes are on you. Please prioritize what is right for all the people of Guam before any subgroup or special interest. Thank you for hearing my perspectives on these two bills. Thank you, Mr. Tegarty. Mr. Bainham. <clears throat> Good evening, Senators, and thank you for allowing the public to be heard on the legislation being, being proposed to address Guam's dire financial situation. My name is Andre Bainham, and I am here on behalf of Guamanians for Fair Government. We are not Republican. We are not Democrat. We are not for, against any candidate, nor are we running for any elected office. We are concerned citizens of Guam, dedicated to good governance and restoring the people to its rightful place in our government. The financial situation facing the people of Guam is real, and its effects may be damaging to all the people that call Guam home. Therefore, it is your responsibility to moderate the fallout of this financial crisis so that the people are not negatively impacted to a great degree. I say it is your responsibility because leaders, both past and present, are responsible for the predicament we find ourselves in today. Leaders both past and present have continued to grow this government year after year, adding agency after agency to provide political patronage to supporters so that they can solidify their hold on the people and thus solidifying their hold on office. As a matter of fact, just last month, this legislature, knowing the financial situation facing our island, passed a, a, a law creating a brand new government agency, the Office of Technology, further growing our government. Now you want to raise taxes and cut pay? I say no way. It is easy to blame the federal government, but the truth is you handle the taxes paid by the hardworking people of Guam. You decide how and where it's spent, where it's spent, and what did you decide? In 2014, Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio called a special session, and you guys had a party with the people's money, giving yourselves a $40,000 raise. It took two years and an election for you to come to your senses and return the people's money. I bring this up because it's indicative of how this government manages the people's money. Sadly, the party's not over. Because just last month, it was reported that raises in the amount of thirty dollars and $40,000 were handed out to Adeloupe staffers. Now you want to raise taxes and cut pay? I say no way. The mismanagement of tax dollars does not stop with raises, but with the public services it's intended to produce. For example, the people pay taxes to maintain the village roads, and then it's diverted for other purposes. And when the people complain because the roads are in disrepair, you tax the people again to maintain the roads we're already paying taxes on. Now you want to raise taxes and cut pay? I say no way. The hospital has suffered from mismanagement at the highest levels of this government since ever since. The problems of the hospital have been apparent, yet you blame the poor. You blame and want to investigate the doctors and nurses but you offer no other solution than supplemental appropriations and borrowing on the backs of the people. 
You borrow in 2014, you borrow in 2015, you borrowed in 2016 to help the hospital, and it's not enough. And now you want to cut taxes, now you want to raise taxes and cut pay? I say no way. There is no greater example of government waste and excess than with the 19 village mayors and seven vice mayors of Guam. They have a budget of close to $10 million, a salary with benefits totaling over $100,000 each, a private office, private 24-hour vehicles, a special meeting hall and a travel budget to attend strawberry festivals in the Philippines. But when the schools which educate their constituents ask them to cut the grass, they say, cut your own grass because you don't have money. Now you want to raise taxes and cut pay? I say, no way. There are many more examples of mismanagement, waste, and excess perpetrated on the people by this government. In 2017 alone, $370,000 in, exec in executive security overtime pay was used to protect the governor both on and off island. Couldn't this money and resources have been used to protect the true VIPs of Guam, the people? Private 24-hour vehicles, plush rented office space, a large budget with a huge office staff. And oh, did I mention the travel to the Strawberry Festival in the Philippines? Senators, as long as the public servants of this island continue to be more concerned with their longevity in office or their special interest deals or their egos rather than serving the people of and then serving the people, Guam will continue to see dilapidated schools, a struggling pub public hospital, and an underfunded and undermanned police department, not to mention a baroque government. With that said, before you raise taxes and cut pay, cut your budget, consolidate office space, three senators per office, and reduce the number of people you have working for you. Senator Bob Klitschke ran his office with just one other person and did a great job. You can too. Cut the mayor's pay to 2014 levels and restrict the use of private vehicles. Do the same for the administration's budget. Cut the pay of appointed, official, uh, uh, appointed officials to 2014 levels. Mothball agencies and departments with redundant functions and prioritize, prioritize, prioritize the core mandated responsibilities of this government, which are, which are health, safety, and education. If it's still not enough, look into reducing the number of mayors on this island to just five and turn this legislature into a part-time body. And if that's not enough, do more. Anything you can, because it's your responsibility. Ask not from an already overburdened public what they can do for you, but ask yourself what you can do for the public. Until this is done, don't tell an already overburdened public that you have to raise taxes and cut pay. You already raised the liquid fuel tax this year. Power has gone up significantly, and the prices of just about everything else will rise this year because of mismanagement, waste, and excess. Bill 244 and 245 will increase the cost of living of Gu on Guam and push the middle class further down the economic ladder leading to reduced personal spending, which in turn will hurt government revenues and core government services. Most troubling is that people may start to leave this island not because they want to, but because they can't afford to live here. And what will happen to your tax base then? So I say no way, find another way. No way to build 244 and no way to build 245. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Bainham. Mr. Snogestein. Excuse me, Mr. Speaker and members of the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication. I'm Arthur St. Augustine. I appear to you this evening as a private citizen and employee of the Department of Public Health and Social Services Division of Senior Citizens and also a business owner. I appear to speak to specific points and aspects of Bill Numbers 224-34 and 245-34. I am in support of Bill 245's intent to raise the business privilege tax from 4% to 6%. As of the two measures for consideration, Bill Number 244 and 245, it is Bill 245 that moves to generate funds for government operations with no impact to the salaries of the employees of the government of Guam as compared to Bill 244. In terms of Bill 244, Section 4, a reduction in the salary for employees under the Competitive Wage Act of 2014 is not inclusive, it is selective. Therefore, it is my recommendation this provision be removed for consideration 
as it is unfair for a group of government employees to be expected to carry the burden to reduce part of the government's projected expenditures while others are not affected equally. Further, the morale of our employees will be affected. If reduced, we may see employees seek part-time employment or employment elsewhere that the employee would otherwise not pursue had their annual household income not been reduced. In this, these instances, seeking part-time or employment elsewhere is really driven by the need to earn enough to make ends meet. Then we have two income households. These households whose income is from the governor of Guam, that would be two reductions in a single household. This would truly compound the challenge of this home front, like many others, to meet their living expenses. Living expenses include, but not limited to food, shelter, utilities, and transportation. I do not come with the answers as to the remedy of our financial challenge. I appear appealing to you as our leaders to lead us away from this provision and seek alternative measures to reduce our annual expenditures of government. I also ask that Section 6, filling a certain FTEs prohibited, be revisited to allow for limited term appointment, LTAs, of approved classified positions within the government of Guam. My request is based on grants awarded to Guam that are short term, that an LTA or competitive LTA would be most suitable, efficient, and viable means to employ someone on a limited term to carry out the activities of the grant that is not intended to be sustained after the grant has expired. As we all pursue our careers, it is intrinsic in most that we strive to achieve, and through achievement, we anticipate salary that is commensurate to the work we perform. Therefore, it is in the best interest of the employees that we maintain the Competitive Wage Act of 2014. Even with the CWA of 2014, with over two decades of no adjustment to the Governor Guam pay scale, we are still behind the national pay. Let's keep the CWA of 2014 in place. This will move towards ensuring our local talent stays with the government of Guam. It sends the message that government of Guam employees are valued and recognized for the hard work and dedication that they, that we all provide as public servants. Submitted for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Borja. Good evening, Mr. Speaker, senators. My name is Michael Borja, the director of the Department of Land Management. Bill numbers 244 and 255 being, or 245 being heard today each seek a resolution to an unanticipated shortfall to our government's revenues because of a newly enacted national tax code. While both seek to increase and seek an increase in the business privilege tax as part of the solution, Bill 244 also imposes a mandate that would directly affect the wages of employees in my department. Every department and agency of this government offer a service unique in their own way. The Department of Land Management has the only land survey team engaged in the survey of public lands as well as regulating land, all land surveys. Our land administrators oversee the management of public lands. Our land planners ensure the proper uses of all our lands. And our records managers maintain and secure all land records dating back to the Spanish era. In 2012, Governor Calvo issued a reorganization advisory to consolidate the Chamorro Land Trust Commission and the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission with the Department of Land Management. This has, been, this has proven to be extremely beneficial, ensuring all public lands are maintained and managed properly and allows the synergy of all the elements of the department to reshape and assist the commissions. It also reduced the overhead costs of management and I am a proponent of the continued reorganization of our government to be more efficient and to be more effective and to more effectively serve our customers, the people of Guam. My department has been fortunate to be funded by its own revenue source collected by fees for our services. However, that is also not enough, so it receives a minor infusion from the general fund. My goal has been to wean the department from the general fund and in January 2017, we submitted draft legislation to modify our fee schedule. The current fee schedule established by law has not been updated in over a decade and fees do not cover the cost of the services we offer. We have been working with our respective legislative committee and hope to have the legislation introduced and I humbly ask for your support for that bill. Following the passage of the new tax code, 
My department complied immediately with, the gov with Governor Calvo's call for a reduction in our budget. We also proposed additional cuts by reducing our leased office space footprint that would bring a significant reduction in our annual rent. The inter this internal reorganization would allow the department to reduce other contractual services, garnering more, service more savings. Please know that my department, like all others, are committed to long-term savings in our non-personnel expenses and have been well before this current matter arose. However, our manpower requirements have dwindled through natural attrition over the years. Our current funding only covers 48% of our authorized personnel and with a hiring freeze, it halts the replacement of those who have departed in the last six months. We anticipate more personnel reduction because of our, many of our senior staff are ripe for retirement. Losing these experienced persons will deal, deal a significant blow in our services and even more so if they are not replaced. The Department of Land Management's personnel are dedicated servants of the people. They work diligently, but their workload mounts, are depart, mount, uh, mounts as, their, as departed co-workers are not replaced. It has been my task to ensure that they have the necessary tools to conduct their jobs, but as these cuts continue, even accomplishing that has become more difficult. Faced with the likelihood of wage freezes and possible cuts, they are reminded that they once were the few that took the hit in this government because these hits only affect the employees of the line agencies. These bills you are hearing testimonies today strive for a solution to a problem not anticipated several months ago. The governor's bill puts a sunset to the increase on the business privilege tax, but it also recognizes the need that health and education be a priority to this community. This administration and the next one have a new altered reality to deal with. This administration has cut expenses, consolidated activities, and will continue to do so. I ask this body to support the passage of Bill 245-34. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Regis. Good evening, Mr. Speaker and Senators. My name is William Regis, Director for the Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm here in support of the Governor's Bill 245-34 and in opposition of the Speaker's Bill 244-34. The reasons? The Governor's Bill does not touch salaries. The Speaker's Bill would cut back the salaries. The Governor's Bill provides funding to the hospital, Guam Department of Education, and government stability. The Speaker's Bill provides no funding source. Mr. Speaker and Senators, at the present time, DPR employs a grand total of 55 employees. These hardworking, dedicated employees have responsibilities of manning, maintaining, and servicing the people of Guam in areas such as one. I have a total of 16, 16 maintenance workers that are assigned to maintain at least 50% of the total 76 parts island-wide. The rest are under contract. At least half of the 16 employees has enough time in service to retire. Any reduction of their salary would force them to retire. What an impact this would have in maintaining the parks. Two, lifeguards. There are only eight lifeguards manning Hagatna Pool, Matapang Beach, and Ipau Beach. Lucky for us, Tedilupo is presently closed due to repairs and renovations. Right now, their hourly wage is an average of $11.89. Any reductions, as much as I don't want to do it, we might resort to closing them. Park Rangers, we have a total of three officers covering our parks island-wide. And if I may, I want to read uh, just a short testimony from the park rangers, and I'm pretty sure they're here. And it's from them. It says, from DPR park patrol officers to the Guam legislature. We, the undersigned, which is only three of them, were Kin Mesa, Pedro Lisama, and Ronald Romotigi. We, the undersigned, are in favor of the governor's bill 245 and opposed bill 244 proposed by the speaker. The reason why we feel this way is because for the longest time, 
we, the government of Guam employees, were being compensated far below the national standard, and the raises given to us are well deserved. It would be adding insult to injury if our races are rolled back. We, the dedicated park patrol officers, have taken an additional duties in order to realize the department's mandates. Additionally, the governor's bill is simple and is the most viable option, especially during this time-sensitive period. Please hear our voices and pass the governor's bill into law and reject the speaker's well-intended but detrimental bill. That's from my park officers. Mr. Speaker and Senators, you could just imagine the impact this would have in our ability to provide the needed and expected services to our people in terms of the parks, the pools, the beaches, and the protection of them by the park <coughs> rangers. I'm pretty sure that by now, since this public hearing started this morning, that there should be more than enough messages or justifications as to what the impact would be. In closing, and I want to say it in tomorrow, of course, in a respectable manner, put for both, munga mangondu ni swedunia. Put for both, munga mangondu ni nilala niya. Put for both, chogi i maulik parasia. Sidzus mas. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions of this panel? No? Thank Mr. you. Mr. Speaker, uh, I have a comment after listening to the administration officials. You know, I, the tipping point event for these hearings was the Trump tax cut. And I have seen nothing from the administration or this body preparing for the next shoe to drop, which is the Trump 2019 budget cuts. Earlier projections were ranging between 30 and 35 percent, but the director of budget for the Trump administration has announced they are looking at tax cuts between 40 and 45 percent to help offset the cost of the tax cut. So right now, we're here because of the Trump tax cut. The budget cut is coming in 2019 and government of Guam receives a substantial portion of its funding from federal funds. So are we going to be back here in six months for another 50% increase in business tax if that goes through? That's my question because I don't see anyone in Adeloupe talking about the budget cuts and I don't see anybody here in the legislature talking about those as well. We've discussed it in SES. Thank you very much. This panel is excused. MJ Palomo, RJ Remetic, they're collecting them. Ed, did you ask Andre for his testimony? RJ Ramotik, Ariel Evermore. Ariel Evaristo. Lieutenant Lazama, Jesse Pelican, Tony Santos, Jane Dia, Afligui from Cent, uh, from EPA. Jay 
Jane Dia, Connie Apiag, Ju Junie Lynn, Frank Luhan, Mr. Luhan, Benjamin Pangolinen, Vilda, Joe Snagustine, Marvin Aguilar, Peter Lahi, Penmore, Card we seal Singh, Mr. Singh, Johnny Sublon. Thomas Poole, Linda Flynn, Lorelai Chrysostomo, Anthony Rossetti, why do we start from you, Johnny? Start and go down this way. To do smart seat, no. Senior speaker, then Hamzu, Senior Dodge, Shagiolo, Kimite, Guaho, Senior Zanin Sablan, you must get a look at the department in the car hog in a handsome moro. The Matuzu Pabi. Uh, Sangan i sidentin i tauto sia in pliao ni ubisita i todu i zisheni i man matsotso tsu gi under gi padzun i departamento tagui i i Guam Public Library i PBS uh, Guam Kaha uh, Hagatnya Restoration i Samoro Village than the Imperial Museum Lokwe. But todu u atan no sienta na Imperial, 60 people that work for under the umbrella of tomorrow affairs. The Ajao Sodani man matsotsutsu ni go piernamento, edzu siao kuntutu si jalo. So I need to compare half a no. So I need to mean a guy head, a mean a guy head, a dos quattro, a dos ciento quattro quattro na bio, then also a mean a guy head, a dos quarenta cinco na na proposition. Pes no zoma atan. Malugui no sinintinia. Pisu sangani na 
y 244 no promo rollback y y su dunia y 2014 za y y bill 245 y promo Tazap, tipo ma pazza e sua dunia. Resi masangonio na no zamangwento sa ma discuti todo e zo discuti todo e zama compara. Resi lengna sangoni fani se ne dosia na insopopoti e dosiento quaranta cinco na bio ok e bio e gubiat nun calvo pues no I came to support bio 245 das 34 and I ask all senators no so gui para e minau le ki tauto isla e tau tauta zani para e Irencia y cultura. Guano pabis como nayo uno na minuto guni pabisangan gifnot somoro. Manhali y corazón gihinasu zan giirencia en man somoro y fuerza. Y tiningu zan y ginin y finat no guni manomco. Monabali na Tana tat kilo i kustumbri, tana tat kilo i kutura, zani irencia, tana tat kilo i sinentini tauto siafenena, ta adai tau tauta, sa estina kutura, zani irencia, hagas ma pesigi, ni menem pinyosu na tsamoru para u manat lola, historian Manainata. And I'll say it in English. The strength and ingenuity and the legacy of the tomorrow people resides in their hearts and spirits. It is built by the values and traditions they learn from our Manamko that are passed down the ages. Our culture, our heritage, first it's how we feel. We have to take care of how our people, and I meant our whole island, okay? And in, in this case, our employees of government of Guam. And to pre persevere through the years because of the courage and those mission in life is really to perpetuate our story of our ancestors. And that story is, we become ancestors in the future. So, ni zatana bifaisa namzo ni fan zatapan afa maulik sogi mas maulik parahita para itau tau ta guinigi isla zan itau tau guahan biba isla guahan susu masi. Thank you very much. Mr. Snuggs. Alpha Day Honorable Speaker Benjamin J.F. Cruz and Honorable Speakers, Guao Sio Seat Fadi San Augustine, Zana Bifunu Tsamoro Lao Malaza Bifunu Inglis, Esto Tugi Zoko Testimony Gifunu Inglis, the Sidus Masi Sijani Sablam for that inspirational uh, comment in tomorrow. My name is Jose Atfazi San Augustine. I am the Special Assistant to the Governor and the Administrator for the Guam Veterans Affairs Office. I am here this evening to testify in opposition of Bill 244 and in support of Bill 245. I acknowledge all the efforts by all elected officials to find solution to what remains to be a difficult times ahead for our island. So first, we must compare notes, determine the best course of action to lessen the burden to everyone 
that will be impacted by both of these bills. Bill 244 proposes to increase the gross receipt tax from 4% to 5%. May I correct that to business privilege tax? It works for me. Bill 244 proposes to reduce fiscal year 2018 budget for the general fund appropriation. Sp speaking in part of the Guam Veterans Affairs Office, our annual budget is 633,000, one of the smallest budget throughout the agency of Guam. We are just barely making it. Many of you old senators know that. The agency has placed two positions on hiring freeze, and a third one is imminent. The agency has always taken stringent cost savings initiative to include turning off lights and appliances when not in use, to the most recent of reducing the purchasing of fuel for brush cutting by doing more physical hands-on weeding and pulling of brushes. The one and only metri uh, military veterans cemetery on Guam. Thank you for your service. Can you imagine not having the appropriate staff to honor and care for those that have served? In case the message is not clear, we move forward with Bill 244. There might not be services because employees will quit due to burnout. The cemetery needs at least six permanent employees. Right now I am operating with just three permanent employees. I have talked to them regarding both bills and they're more concerned of their pay being taken away. I say thank you for just a short-term temporary solution. What is the permanent solution? We've seen this happen before. We cannot afford for it to continue. The agency cannot take any more reduction. Bill 244 proposes to freeze the Competitive Wage Act of 2014 until March 1st, 2019. Many government of Guam employees are barely making ends meet. Many have banked on the Competitive Wage Act of 2014 for loans. So what are they going to tell the bank when they cannot fulfill their own financial obligation because of the cuts? And by the way, this bill, place, this bill places the burden on only the government of Guam employees. I support Bill 24534 in that the burden is placed equally across the board to all that are going to be impacted. The proposed increase of the business privilege tax from 4 to 6 percent allows me to determine how I spend my money and not someone to dictate how to spend. If I cannot afford to eat at McDonald's, then on the way home I would sh shop at Payless or elsewhere and purchase rice and meat and cook. Salaries of the hardworking government of Guam employees will not be touched. 75% of the business privilege tax will go to GMH. 25% to DOE, and 1% to maintain government stability. 55 civilian sector workers, 160,000 population on Guam. A larger amount of those numbers utilize GMH. What's your solution? I 
I was once very poor as well. But I found ways to prevent from getting injured and having to use the facility. But there's many times where we cannot prevent that. As we get old, we have illnesses. What's your solution? If Bill 245 is not an option for you senators, what's your permanent solution? I thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lohan. Hafidei. Good evening, Mr. Speaker, Vice Speaker Tawahi, and members of the legislature. Sijus Masi, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak in support of Bill 245-34 in opposition to Bill 244 in its current form. My name is Frank Luhan, Jr., and I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the Government of Guam. I will keep my testimony brief. I currently lead the operations of the Office of Technology. The numbers that have been crunched over the last few weeks have been derived from OTEC's core systems and its databases. OTEC supports end users from the Dedido clinics in the north to Inarahan in the south. OTEC has three data centers located in different areas of our island geography. Senators, the most critical asset for this office is not the network, not the vendors, not its contracts, not the systems or servers, not the desktops, nor the software. The most critical asset is the experience and knowledge base of the OTEC workforce and the collective end users it supports and serves every single day of each fiscal year. It takes a pervasive synergy and collaboration that leverages technology in a way that helps the GovGuam workforce to deliver a better product and service each and every day of the year. Today, our office has an approved workforce of 15 employees on our staffing pattern who diligently serve over 3,000 line agency employees with several hundred core system applications which deliver products and services for over 160,000 island citizens. The employees of the Office of Technology are dedicated, hardworking, and are motivated by the hope and promise that the future will bring in the next fiscal year. Recruiting a qualified IT workforce is not a local problem. It's a global problem. OTEC's greatest tactical challenge remains protecting and defending our IT resources from unauthorized intrusions, aka cyber, cybersecurity. OTEC's greatest strategic problem or weakness is the recruiting of a viable technology workforce aligned with keeping our island community globally synchronized with the 21st century. The Competitive Wage Act implemented in 2014 is significant for most of the Gulf Guam workforce and relevant to this public hearing. We should not take steps backwards, but continue to forge ahead for our people. Since the passing of President, Trump, President Trump's job stimulus bill late last year, the realization that the revenue stream for the governor of Guam will be significantly reduced by over $67 million for this fiscal year is distressing and polarizing for the government of Guam workforce. Let's commit to work together in this time of uncertainty. Bill 245-34 in its present form offers the most hope for our people today. On behalf of Governor Calvo and Lieutenant Governor Tenorio, it's my pleasure to support Bill 245-34 as your Chief Technology Officer. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dan Grow. Good evening, Speaker Cruz, Vice Speaker Tulai, esteemed Senators of 34th Guam Legislature. My name is Walter S. Leon Guerrero, and the Administrator of Guam EPA, and I'm a proud employee of Government of Guam. I come, I come before you tonight to voice my trepidation about Bill 244-34. I temper this trepidation, however, with careful consideration for all the hard work and foresight that went into introducing this type of legislation and its attempt at addressing the shortfall at hand. It's quite clear that this federal mandate, the, the tax cuts, meant for the goose, has once again applied a cookie cutter approach for the gander. I do not envy the seats that any of you are sitting in today, nor do I have the desire to tell you how to do your jobs. But I must convey that should Bill 244-34 pass into the law, I'm not sure if my seat would be any better. I've been with the agency for more than 24 years, Gov Guam 25 years total, serving as administrator for the past year and a half. I consider myself fortunate to be in this position. I lead a team of coworkers charged with ensuring, ensuring, ensuring that our island maintain a high quality environment and that environmental de degradation of our island not be allowed. I am leading a knowledgeable, knowledgeable unit full of capa uh, capability and passion to take on the challenges of issues like radon mitigation, wellhead protection, water resource management, hazardous materials, hazardous waste, and numerous other programs. Ultimately ensuring that the adver adverse environmental impacts from civil and military activity are not tolerated on our island. Like all regulatory agencies, the services that we provide to our island are carried out with deliberate sense of conviction, undeterred by external influence or distraction. We are a family, we are a team. When members of my family thrive, I thrive. When they suffer, I also suffer. Many of, many of us in, my, in, in our team, Guam EPA, take issue with 244-34, specifically for Section 4, which seeks a freeze of salaries um, by the enactment of the Government of Guam Competitive Wage Act of 2014, essentially restoring levels of government compensation to the levels that existed in the 90s. We are not in the 90s. Our government, is, its services, capabilities, employees, sense of job satisfaction have in fact modernized, calling for the need to modernize compensation that is both just and commensurate of our progress, our performance, and our dedication. Everyone in the room can agree to, to a point that combination of cuts in revenue and revenue enhancements are necessary to overcome this shortfall and to bring sustainability to our government. While I can appreciate the out-of-the-box thinking, I do not feel that Bill 244-34 provides a proper combination of cuts or enhancements to accomplish this goal. I do feel, however, that 245-34 is a good start as it presents more potential to achieve the goals of spelled out in its language. Make no mistake, I'm not criticizing any of you nor the job you're doing. I am critical of people that, that do talk ill of Guam employees, including the team of Guam EPA, because that team is also my family. And when you talk bad about my family, I do not appreciate that. And I hope you can understand that. That is my written um, uh, statement, but I do want to add, um, I have written testimony from five different individuals from my agency. I have staff sitting behind me. Um, we had a staff meeting this morning and discussions all arisen concerning cut and pay, what happens to retirees or, or soon to be retirees that are looking, you know, whether it's the old system or even the new system where they get the highest pay, what's going to happen to all that. There's a lot of concerns that um, the, the team of Guam EPA hopes gets addressed and can get uh, better answers uh, once we iron this out. Again, thank you so much. Um, I do appreciate all the hard work, all the time you guys put in today and, and the last couple of months. But please listen to the team of Guam EPA. They do not need their, their salaries and benefits cut. They need to pr pursue their jobs and continue to work hard for us. Thank you.
Thank you. And would all of you please provide the, your written testimony to the staff so we can include it in the uh, um, committee report, ma'am? Thank you very much, um, Senators and Mr. Speaker. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today. Um, I do not have a very long testimony, but I hope it will um, have the effect of making a difference in um, the approach that you will take in making a decision about our future. I appreciate the efforts of both your office and your fellow legislators, as well as the governor, to address the impending financial crisis we are facing, resulting from the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Both bills have merit in terms of increasing a source of revenue, but neither addresses the fact that this is not a short-term crisis, but a long-term situa situation that we have been dealing with year after year and affects us all. I would ask this esteemed body to consider a long-term solution to our financial situation that has been considered and pushed aside in the past, and that is to eliminate the 4% business privilege tax and replace it with a 6% sales tax. This could be done and monitored over the next year or two to determine if the tax could be reduced if carefully prioritized budgetary needs are met. The latter is transparent, easier to track and collect, can be applied across the board for goods and services, but can also allow for exemptions for certain categories of goods and services, such as medications and other health and medically related services to reduce the burden to the most vulnerable people of Guam. A set-aside could be done for the top three priorities of health, including behavioral health, direct services and prevention services, of which I'm, I am a part of, education and public safety, with the remainder to be allocated based on carefully weighted criteria that would determine what is essential versus what is good to have. This, combined with elimination of waste and essential improvement in the efficiency of procurement and hiring processes and delivery of services, would do much more towards the achievement of a lean, effective government that truly serves the people. I also do not support the rollback of salaries for employees in the executive and legislative branches, with an exemption for the judiciary and autonomous agencies. Such action will have devastating consequences in terms of people's abilities to meet essential needs such as housing, utilities, medical insurance, debt payments, etc. To apply such a rollback to only part of the local government workforce is also insulting and discriminatory. Lastly, I would strongly ask or even beg for the consideration of the legislature and the administration to eliminate the incomprehensible delays in procurement and hiring that is funded by federal dollars. Instead, allow agencies with federal grants the authority to procure up to a specific... I thank you very much for this opportunity again, and I hope that my words will make a difference. Um, working for an agency that has very limited resources and um, asks for too little, quite frankly, when it comes to our budget. We are looking at possibly a 50% reduction in our budget of what we previously asked for last fiscal year. Um, I do not see how we can possibly function in talking with our, our financial people. They're talking about eliminating the budget for food for our residential units, for our people in our residential units. I, I, I can't even imagine having to think that way. So I would ask that you, you take these things into consideration. I know you have such a difficult task on your plate, and, um, but I really do feel that there is a solution that can be, um, can be better put forth for the people of Guam and can address the needs that we have. We simply have to prioritize. We have to cut back. We have to get leaner and more efficient. We have to certainly not be giving back money because we our processes prevent us from even expending the money and having to return it back to the federal government. I know within my agency we will very aggressively pursue federal funds, but it does us no good when it takes six months for us to even be able to expend the funds. That should never happen. So I really ask for your support um, and your dedication to continue to pursue improvements that we can 
actually be able to provide our services to our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if you provide a copy of your testimony to our staff. Good evening, Mr. Speaker, Senators, uh, fellow Guam residents. My name is Sanjay Diwan. I'm from the uh, business community. I want to start by saying I do not support the raising of the GRT, the gross receipts tax. I do have a solution for it, but I do support leaving GovGuam salaries the same as long as they're reasonable and fair uh, based on your research. So I am for that. I have an article uh, about the negative impacts of uh, gross receipts taxes, which I'm not sure if um, everyone knows that gross receipt taxes were peaked in the 1920s and 30s, and after that, they were not used uh, anymore in states. There's only about four or five states that still use gross receipts taxes. Uh, so knowing that, I'd like to uh, read uh, uh, the core of that article. The flaws of gross receipts taxes are well documented. Gross receipt taxes lead to higher consumer prices, lower wages, and fewer job opportunities as the tax pyramids throughout the production cycle. Unlike a retail sales tax that is assessed only on the final consumer, on the final consumer purchase of a product, a gross receipts tax is assessed at every stage of the production. So knowing that, um, what happens is businesses are going to not only tax uh, a 50% increase, but actually they go overboard. Uh, just to go back on the minimum wage hike, which from, went from 7.25 to 8.25, only one dollar. Um, daycare for ex daycares, just for example, normally which were charging 350 per child a month raised their rates to $475 per child a month. I don't know how $1 raise equates to raising daycare rates $125 per child, where one caretaker's watching about 10 kids um, and you're making, and, and the establishment is making $125 say times 10 kids for just that one caretaker. So what happens is businesses gouge money, okay? Uh, as being part of a, the business community. What happens is vendors, um, uh, the cost of lettuce can go up to three, four bucks for a head of lettuce. Um, so the island is gonna suffer. The people will suffer because businesses will not just pass a 2% increase, but they will actually tack on more, which you will not know. Uh, exactly what it is. So I propose that we go to a visible sales tax. What's, what happens is that the consumer knows exactly what he's paying. So the, the price of the product at the grocery store or any restaurant or establishment stays the same. All the business does is tack on your 6% tax, sales tax, or seven, or eight, do whatever you want, raise it. Because the consumer has confident that, the, the confidence that they know how much more is going to the government, rather than blindly paying more. What happens is businesses um, uh, look bad in the process when it's a GRT increase, because now you're competing, uh, you look higher, you look like an expensive establishment, and consumers start looking at, oh, this place is more expensive or, or so forth, and you start competing. Businesses start competing and uh, raising prices. And consumers lose confidence in uh, establishments. Um, of course, then the businesses also raise, uh, I mean, cut hours, lower wages to compensate for the increase in GRT. So I'm saying is you want your 50% increase but go through it with a sales tax method. You're getting exactly what you want. It's visible, and the business can keep that money aside. They get what they're supposed to get for their product, and the extra has gone into sales tax. Um, 
main thing is the consumer knows where the money is going, how much is going, where, and it's a win-win, I feel. We keep Gov Guam salaries the way they are, um, do not lower them, prices of goods are going up, I think we should just leave, uh, consumers are already living paycheck to paycheck, it's, it's not getting any better on Guam. Uh, for the years uh, I've seen, it's just continually just things are going up. So I hope you consider the sales tax. Uh, there's only five states in the U.S. using it, and it's, it has a negative impact. Uh, so sales tax would be the way to go, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kuzostomo. <clears throat> Witness notice, Speaker Cruz, Vice Speaker Tulahi, and Senators. Um, my name is Lorley Chrysostomo. I'm the Director of the Guam Energy Office. I'm very disappointed to find out that Bill 244 proposes to punish a few hardworking individuals dedicated to serve the public by affecting their salaries, deserving increments based on their job performance, and much more. The Competitive Wage Act of 2014 was a significant action of moving forward of good governance, especially since it amended the salaries to match the workload of duties of many job positions. Addressing Government of Guam's revenue shortfall shouldn't be to reduce the wages of a couple of thousands of public stewards while the wages of several thousands of others are to be untouched. Freezing and rolling back the salaries of just a selected few is poor governance. As a small line agency fully funded by federal grants, the Guam Energy Office will be impacted by, B by Bill 244 regarding personnel to implement energy projects and activities. How disheartening for my employees dedicated to carry out their tasks yet have a reduction of ten to fifteen thousand dollars in wages that would affect their well-being. Bill 245 proposes measures that would address Government of Guam's expected shortfall while fun fully funding Guam Memorial Hospital to operate properly. It doesn't target salaries of selected groups of dedicated public stewards. Bill 244 is not the solution to address Government of Guam's shortfall. Bill 245 is the solution to physically stabilize the Government of Guam. Thank you, and Sizu Osmasi. Thank you. Anybody have any? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, I, I just want to mention, because the Office of Technology is here, and I'm, you know, I'm the, the author of the creation of the, uh, the, the, the speaker was a co-sponsor of that measure. And I just wanted to provide some clarification, because the earlier panel, a member, uh, mentioned uh, this body created a new office. Um, I just want to make it very clear that office already existed and was established in 2014, and we basically just um, uh, provided the office for more greater autonomy by having it a standalone agency uh, without any additional resources or funding. So I just wanted to make sure that that was put into the record. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to? If not, I want to thank all of you for bearing with us, and uh, you're excused. Thank you very much for your testimony this evening. John Kramer, John Borja, Linda Flynn, Christine Feheran, Edward Conception, I guess we have There's no one else to testify. If not, Bill 244 and 245 will be deemed heard and this this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>